In this video, we're going to continue our discussion about vulnerabilities by considering network vulnerabilities and attacks. Network vulnerabilities are vulnerabilities that directly involve networks and their protocols. So network traffic is vulnerable to interception, being read and manipulated, and network services, that are services that are offered over a network, are vulnerable to poor availability by being overloaded. Sniffing is a type of uh, vulnerability which involves listening to traffic on a wired or wireless network. It may involve a man-in-the-middle attack where traffic is routed through to a laptop or device and then forwarded onto the intended true destination while being intercepted in the middle. Wireless uh, of course, can be passively sniffed because it's broadcast. So essentially, if as long as it's unencrypted, you can just listen in at the same uh, channel as uh, it is being broadcast, and then you can actually intercept it that way. So there's no concept of man in the middle in that uh, side. Although we can actually force wireless to go through a man in the middle attack. Spoofing is another network attack which alters communications to pretend to be a different sender. So caller ID on an SMS or phone call, for example, uh, can be manipulated so that it looks like it's coming from somebody valid, but in fact it's not. Senders of emails is another example of that. On a network, it's usually done by altering TCP IP packets, and it's used as part of a man-in-the-middle attack where we want to spoof the fact that it's not come through and, and, and being intercepted. A denial of service attack is where we flood a service with fake requests so that real users can't access the service. Distributed denial of service is using many sources for the denial of service attacks, including Internet of Things devices. There's a variety of these types of attacks, mainly focused on how they're actually carried out. Um, but essentially, if you just sat on a browser and repeatedly ta uh, tapped refresh on a website, uh, that would be a form of denial of service. Now, most websites, of course, can handle that. But essentially, what you're doing is writing a program that will create uh, hundreds of thousands of requests in a very short spaces of time and overwhelms the uh, web server so that it's busy dealing with those requests and it can't deal with legitimate ones. As I said, man-in-the-middle attacks intercept network traffic to sniff the packets before passing legit to the legitimate destination or to a destination under the attacker's control. Hacking is another type of network attack. Um, so here we talk about initial access and lateral movement. So initial access is accessing a machine through the use of remote access services or through the exploitation of vulnerabilities in a network service. So in this situation, a, um, the, for example, in the, the vulnerability we talked about with Spam Assassin, which allowed for arbitrary code execution and was accessible via a network, you might do that to create um, an initial access using a shell on the um, target machine. Once you've got onto that machine, you can then use it as a pivot point to other machines on the same or different networks. So if you have a corporate network, which allows uh, different levels of access to internal users uh, as the, from those from the outside, once you've got onto that internal network, you will be able to access resources that are normally only available to those employees that are on the internal network. I'm just going to look at a short video to illustrate the point.
So in that video, uh, the attacker was doing some network sniffing and it illustrated the point that the equipment used was essentially relatively inexpensive and uh, was uh, portable so that it could actually be operated anywhere in public spaces. This is one of the main reasons why we wouldn't trust public Wi-Fi, for example, uh, mostly unencrypted and subject to these types of attacks. And just to bring this home, this is a seven-year-old girl who took exactly 11 minutes to hack the Wi-Fi in a cafe after watching a how-to on YouTube. So I don't think she was actually particularly a, a, a genius or anything. She was just smart and able to follow instructions. So web vulnerabilities are one of the most common uh, set of vulnerabilities because they belong to the most common set of applications that are exposed on networks. And examples of web applications that could be vulnerable are things like banking websites, uh, applications like Netflix streaming um, video and audio, and e-commerce sites like Amazon. Of course, uh, the range of applications are, is huge and internally we use things like the LMS, um, Callista, the student management system, and uh, accounting systems, all of these things which are available, sometimes publicly, uh, but also through internal networks. Web applications communicate with browsers and send code uh, and media to display. And some of the functionality will run on the browser itself. Uh, so the browser might run JavaScript, that does some um, app, uh, application functionality on the browser and then communicates with the server to, to carry out some actions, for example, transferring money, for example. There are numerous places where vulnerabilities can exist in all of this and there are common ones that occur and still occur repeatedly. So this is where OWASP comes in. Um, this is a project called the Open Web Application Security Project, and that maintains a list of the top 10 vulnerabilities. It's not suggesting that those are the only vulnerabilities that you should care about, but it's trying to focus developers and organizations' efforts to concentrate on these because they're the most commonly exploited. So, they start off with different classes of errors, um, the first one being errors that are introduced by programmers, and that may include things like authentication errors, not authenticating um, for access to administrative controls, for example, on a web application, uh, input sanitation, sanitization, so not checking that people haven't put malicious script, uh, JavaScript or database script, SQL injection, for example, um, that's a common one even to this day and we're going to exploit that in the lab by doing a SQL injection to gain access to an administrator's user account on a website. Uh, security and access generally is another problem and this may include things like being able to hijack another user, getting access to information that we shouldn't have because of our privilege level, um, other types of um, access type errors. Then there are a class of errors called configuration errors, which involve things like insufficient logging or monitoring. So we haven't logged what people are doing so that in the case of an attack of some sort, we're not able to find out or even detect that an attack is actually underway. Again, security configuration is another important uh, aspect of this. That security is not only controlled by programming, but also by the configuration of the website itself. Uh, then there are programming errors that exist through third-party components that are being used um, in sites uh, like content management systems like WordPress, for example, which use plugins. This is a common source of error. Uh, WordPress itself may be secure, but you may be using a plugin which has a vulnerability that opens your website up to exploit. Um, this is becoming an increasingly problematic area of errors. Uh, it's essentially a type of supply chain error where you're trusting a third party to have done the right thing and not done something malicious, um, which has evaded the, the uh, detection from sites like Google Play, for example, even Apple Store, um, and also sites that provide programming frameworks like Python for Python, Ruby, and other languages.
In order to find vulnerabilities, we can do vulnerability scanning. We can do this either uh, automatically using certain applications, or we can do it using people or a combination of both. Obviously, there are people that are operating the vulnerability scanners, but um, they may then go on to do their own scanning independently of the automation. So there are a variety of different products here. Uh, Nmap is a network scanner. OpenVAS is a open source vulnerability scanner, which is very sophisticated. Uh, Burp Suite is very much like um, OWASP Zap, which we use in the labs. And uh, finally, there's a product called Nessus, which is sort of the go-to scanning tool for web applications that most commercial companies will use. Uh, there is a free version that you can use to try out, um, but it has a limited number of IP addresses that you can scan with it. So these products look for vulnerabilities based on a database of information that they have, of known vulnerabilities uh, that relate to specific software products and specific versions. So it depends on their ability to actually detect, first of all, the software in the first place, and secondly, the version of that software that's running. It doesn't try and exploit the vulnerabilities, even though you can, as a, as a, a user, go into to a tool like Burp Suite, for example, and configure it to attack and exploit. And technically, Nmap will run scripts that essentially look for the vulnerability, and you could argue that that's actually exploiting it at the same time. But it doesn't actually go to the extent of running remote code execution and uh, grabbing a remote shell, for example. So people can be brought in to actually conduct the automated scan and usually um, penetration testers, uh, ethical hackers, for example, will do start a, uh, an assignment by doing an automated scan. Um, but penetration testing is where professionals use tools and their schools, skills to look for vulnerabilities and they agree the scope of what it is they're testing. It may be a specific application, it may be a network, it may be all of the applications on a network. It can be done uh, with certain levels of knowledge about what they're attacking and looking for. And that's referred to as white box, gray box, and black box. So white box is where uh, the attackers, the penetration testers, know in detail what they're attacking. So the software, the configuration, for example, uh, where it exists. Uh, they may have even access to the source code of that application. Black box is the uh, essentially converse of that, uh, where you, the uh, penetration testers know nothing about the environment and are approaching it with zero initial knowledge. And then grey box is somewhere in between those two approaches. So penetration testers will look for vulnerabilities. Uh, it may involve some exploitation, but uh, um, they will limit what they're doing and usually they will do it with the knowledge of the business owners, but not necessarily the users and developers. But of course, they have to ensure that they're not going to disrupt um, the running of the system. Sometimes uh, uh, companies will set up a test environment for the penetration testers to use. Red teams uh, are more dynamic and uh, essentially emulate the tactics, techniques and procedures of known hacker groups. And so it's trying to simulate a more real world situation, which may involve a blue team that are trying to defend against the attack. So I was trying to say, if we had these defenses and a proper defensive team, you know, um, how easy would it be for an attacker uh, group to gain access? Um, the purpose ultimately, however, is to highlight vulnerabilities um, and just to like penetration testing. And so, Companies will vary in their use of the two different approaches, and it's usually based on how sophisticated the organization is. Um, and these testers may or may not be internal to the company as well, depending on how often they do it. One of the big problems about finding vulnerabilities that some companies and organizations, including potentially this university, is that if you disclose a vulnerability, then it's an obligation on the organization to fix it. And if you have got a very busy IT organization, they may not be that keen on uh, just generating a, a great deal of work for themselves. So if you don't know about the vulnerability, you don't need to fix it. Um, and uh, that is you know, actually the approach that some organizations take. 